everyone. Um, thank you for having me. So my name is Nadia, and I'm the co-founder of Aconite, a mixed reality storytelling platform. Let's take a moment to define mixed reality. AR and VR are intrinsically immersive on account of the rich sensory data involved. But there's more to immersion than just larger than life graphics. Even the most beautifully rendered virtual world becomes boring if there's nothing for people to do in it. There are many techniques for making a person feel like they're part of the story. They come to us from a diverse set of storytelling traditions, including live action role playing, psychogeography, escape rooms, alternate reality gaming, and immersive theater, just to name a few. Mixed reality includes AR and VR, but it's bigger than that. It's any technique that blurs the line between reality and fiction, and that's what we're interested in at Aconite. So when my co-founder, Star, who's sitting right there, and I launched the company last fall, it was a more innocent time. Then the election happened. We were thrust into a world of fake news and alternative facts, an all-out war on reality being waged on an institutional level. Um, hold on, this clicker isn't working. Um, that was supposed to, okay, this clicker is a little, okay. So the question that I wanna ask today is, how do I get this clicker to advance my slides? And the other question that I wanna ask today is, what is the responsibility of mixed reality architects, game designers, storytellers, immersive journalists, the people in this room, in an era where reality is constantly getting mixed up for the wrong reasons? across unpredictable contexts. And to answer this question, I started thinking a lot about Russia. Um, so growing up in the Soviet Union, I had what you would call a mixed reality childhood. One time I went outside and I found a crashed, overturned, abandoned public city bus just lying there. It was the best playground I ever had. A few weeks later, all of, the like, all of the dumpsters in our neighborhood were inexplicably filled with gas masks, uh, which I will show you once. Okay, um, can I get batteries for these slides, for this clicker replaced? Um, so no one knew where they came from or why they were discarded. We put them on and ran around the neighborhood terrorizing locals, pretending to be wild beasts. Um, a few weeks later, Chernobyl blew up. The government didn't tell anyone. My mom made me stay indoors for a week. She worked in a hospital and she knew things that other people didn't know. Another time there was an epidemic of poisoned watermelons being sold in stores. The government didn't acknowledge it. The news didn't warn people about it. No one, like no recalls were issued. But the people working in hospitals knew. Um, can I ask for slides to be advanced manually? Thank you. All right, next slide, please. So the people that knew what was really happening did what could to combat the pervasive lie that everything was okay and that the USSR could do no wrong. Next slide. There's a lot we can learn about uses and abuses of mixed reality techniques by and in opposition to authoritarian regimes. And that's largely what this talk is about. Next slide. Um, Russian people were always adept at mapping new layers of reality on top of existing ones. It's in our DNA. You can see it in our oldest fairy tales. As Francis Spufford writes in his book, The Red Plenty, next slide, real Russia's fields grew scraggy crops of buckwheat and rye. Next slide. Story Russia had magic tablecloths serving feasts without end. Next slide. Real Russia's roads were mud and ruts. Next slide. Story Russia abounded in tools of joyful velocity, flying carpets, genies of the rushing air, horses that scarcely touched the grass they galloped on. The stories dreamed away reality's defects. Next slide. The dream of abundance found in Russian fairy tales remained a fixture of the Soviet government's manufactured reality. In 1959, Nikita Khrushchev told a crowd at Lenin Stadium, in our day, the dreams expressed in fairy tales are being translated into reality by man's own hands. Next slide. And it seemed that the fairy tales were coming true. The Russian word for magic carpet was now an ordinary word for airplane, and radios promised that next year there would be tablecloths dispensing infinite food. 
Next slide. For decades leading up to this, the only officially sanctioned art style in Russia was socialist realism. It was art that showed Soviet citizens how they should behave. Next slide, please. Lenin said that the aim of this art style was to create an entirely new type of person. Um, let me see if this will work. Perfect. Um, Stalin called social realist artists engineers of the human soul. But what do pictures of tractors have to do with modern day mixed reality? Soviet propaganda modeled for Soviet citizens proper behavior that the government expected of them. The didactic tools we have for accomplishing the same thing are simulated, within simulated realities are much more potent. As architects of virtual worlds, we need to understand that every facet of the experiences we create, the story worlds that we craft, the game mechanics that we introduce, the player interaction culture that we foster, informs our users' behaviors and identities. As the tech becomes more lifelike and seamless, as it becomes more integrated into everyday life, the systems we build have the potential to deeply transform our users. As larger groups of network players experience our worlds, as group behavior patterns emerge based on our designs, it's imperative that we design responsibly. Because people in a group are more impressionable than one player alone, and large groups of people are capable of all sorts of things, good and bad. Mixed reality, um, mixed reality was not always a form of social control in the USSR. Sometimes it was a form of resistance. It's no coincidence that one of Russia's most groundbreaking works of protest literature, The Master Margarita, has fractured reality as one of its central themes. In this book, the devil, disguised as a traveling magician and accompanied by a disreputable entourage that includes a talking, vodka-swilling black cat, arrives unexpectedly in Moscow at a time when Russia doesn't believe in God, the devil, or fairy tales. The devil stage is a black magic show that thrusts the audience unwillingly into an alternate reality in which their lives stop making sense. In the process, many of the book's characters uncover their true path in life, rather than, one, than the one prescribed to them by their oppressive circumstances. But perhaps the most striking example of mixed reality's power to subvert authority happened in Yugoslavia. A few years before the Bosnian War began, a Slovenian art collective called the Neue Slovenia Kunst began issuing passports to what they called the NSK state. The NSK conferred the status of a state, not to a place, but to the collective minds of its inhabitants. In the words of the NSK, it's a state in time, a state without territory and national borders, a sort of spiritual state. People could get the passports to the NSK at art events or at concerts by Leibach, the NSK's musical wing. The NSK state's slogan was, art is a fanaticism that demands diplomacy. And I believe that as mixed reality becomes more developed, we will have many similar virtual states. So when all hell broke loose in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there was a period when people with Bosnian passports were not being allowed out of the war zone. There are reports of cases when border officials, why there's, like whether sympathetic, drunk, bribed, or themselves NSK citizens, stamped people's NSK passports at checkpoints and allowed them through when their Bosnian passports were considered null and void, helping them to escape the war zone. So, this piece of paper representing an imaginary state saved lives when official government documents failed. We're living in a time when such abstractions are increasingly reshaping the physical world. Um, you know, from World of Warcraft gold farms to like hordes of Pokemon Go players trespassing on federal property, games are terraforming our world. So looking back, the propaganda techniques of the USSR seem so quaint now. The iconography of the Soviet regime, which once stole millions of hearts and minds, is now a kitschy source of amusement. A cardboard cliche upon which countless fictitious dystopias are patterned. In order for state, for state sanctioned mixed reality to remain effective following the Cold War, the apparatus had to adapt. Enter Vladislav Surkov, the great cardinal of the Kremlin, a man widely regarded as, a, as an architect of the modern Russian political system. 
Since assuming office in 1999, Surkov has been the showrunner of Russia's reality. He personally curated what was allowed on Russian television, bringing in neuro-linguistic programming experts and importing top Western reality television producers to create a well-oiled propaganda machine. He created fake opposition parties and even funded real ones, making sure that they got ample screen time to create the illusion of dissent. At the same time, he funded pro-Kremlin motorcycle gangs and fascist youth groups known for burning books and disrupting allegedly degenerate art performances, which is interesting because Surkov himself comes from an avant-garde background. He keeps a framed photo of Borges in front of a set of encyclopedias in his office. He's, he writes lyrics for rock bands and essays on conceptual art. For many years, he studied to be a theater director. Many describe his political strategy as just that, a, co -founding blend, a confounding blend of theater and politics that keeps the public constantly off balance, rendering all political movements absurd and painting Russia's president as a fatherly, stabilizing, uns unshakable focal point amidst all the ideological chaos. Surkov's most recent public performance was the destabilization and annexation of Crimea. A few days before Crimea was annexed, Surkov published a short science fiction story under a pseudonym. The story, called Without Sky, describes a concept called nonlinear warfare, an aimless, ceaseless conflict between not geopolitical forces, but provinces, cities, classes, professions, and genders, in which people aren't always ex exactly sure which side they're fighting for or how long they've been fighting with groups often switching allegiances frequently mid-battle. It's a sinister inversion of asymmetrical game design, a concept fundamental to crafting rich mixed reality experiences. Fusion VR recently did a great educational segment on this, which I highly recommend. In symmetrical games like chess, both players have identical actions available to them in order to win. The black pieces move exactly like the white pieces, but in asymmetrical design, players aren't all using the same set of mechanics. This type of design promotes teamwork, supports different play styles, and creates a richer set of player choices. And we'll see many more per pervasive mixed reality games of this type. I'd like to end this talk with one last concept from game design called the magic circle. In game design theory, the magic circle is a liminal space, either physical or imaginary, that's set aside for play. By entering the magic circle, ordinary people assume extraordinary identities, and real world events take on special meanings. So for example, kicking a ball becomes scoring a point. The magic circle is a place of immersion, narration, catharsis, and dreams. I grew up in a magic circle. When I was little, my parents found these typewritten, carbon copied, hand bound, translations of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which had not been approved by the government for translation due to the themes contained wherein, circulating around their neighborhood. They fell in love with Tolkien's Middle Earth. Together with their neighbors, they started organizing a club for Tolkien fans to gather and compare notes. One day, they just spontaneously decided to start dressing up as the characters and writing collaborative fiction together that gave their characters new adventures in Middle Earth. So essentially, they spontaneously came up with live action role playing behind the Iron Curtain at the same time that it was getting popular in the West. The house was always full of guitar music and candles and the smell of cooking soup. And in the summer, there were campfires and dancing. My dad was Aragorn, my mom was Arwen, and I was their little elf child. My mom would later tell me that doing this helped her to escape Russia's harsh, oppressive society. If I read a book, she told me, I was escaping alone. But by role playing, we were all escaping together. Here's a map that she and her friends drew, reconstructing Middle Earth from the texts that they translated together. That word escape, it's interesting. We think of escapism as something frivolous, as something immature. But something interesting happened in the course of this Tolkien fan club's existence. One day, one of the women in the group announced that she was just gonna start playing as a male character. And everyone reacted to that by saying, sure, why not? Sounds good to us. That's the power of the magic circle. 
Russia was and continues to be a deeply homophobic and transphobic culture. If you were gay in Russia, you could be fired from your job, you lost your friends, you were considered sick. And even my dissident parents at the time were not immune to this type of thinking. But despite this, gameplay became a safe space for my parents and their friends to try something new. They all had that shared suspension of disbelief, this feeling of, it's just a game, so whatever. Um, so this woman took on a male name, Faramir, but she kept female pronouns, and then something even more extraordinary happened. She began having an in-character, in-game romance with another woman playing in their circle. It was very chaste. They wrote each other tender poetry, talking about questing together. I've read some of it and it's beautiful. Within the magic circle of this game, these two women were able to have a very loving same-sex relationship with community support at a time when that should have been impossible in Russia. Magic circles transform us. Thanks to AR, VR, and our internet-connected pocket supercomputers, we have the chance to draw magic circles larger than ever before. As my friend Adam Flint puts it, any sufficiently large magic circle is indistinguishable from reality. The largest magic circles ever drawn by governments promoted xenophobia and ignorance. But I think that we can do better and fight back by drawing even larger circles grounded in agency, empathy, curiosity, and kindness. What new experiments, what economic models, social hierarchies, ways of being human together can we try? I'd love to know the answer, and I'm excited to find out with all of you. So thank you.